Are we ready? All right, thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have no we have no slides for this panel, um, so we can't use it to remind you that the title of the panel is The Impact of Public Health at the Brown School. Um, I think we could have just as easily titled this The Impact of the Brown School on Public Health. I think that's what you're going to hear mostly about um, during this discussion. But I want to thank everybody for, um, for joining this session. We have 37 folks who are following along on Zoom. Welcome to, uh, welcome to you as well. Um, a special thanks to the Brown School Centennial Committee, Jackie and Tanya. Jackie, Tanya, thank you. Behind the scenes, these, uh, these two and the committee that they lead have been planning um, all sorts of uh, exciting events and activities celebrating the Brown School's 100th birthday. And I'm really grateful that they um, uh, had the idea of taking a look at public health at the Brown School as part of this, uh, this year-long celebration. Um, with me today um, to, uh, to talk about this are from your left to right, Ross Brownson, Deborah Hare Joshu, Doug Luke, and Laura Iannotti, folks who've uh, been here from the beginning or darn near the beginning of public health at, uh, at the Brown School. And I'm grateful to them um, for agreeing to be a part of this. So in the next hour, we're going to look both backwards at the origins of public health at the Brown School, but also forward um, to the new School of Public Health. And we're gonna start with that historical perspective. So. Some of you in the room um, were around when this all um, started to take place. It can be traced back, public health at the Brown School can be traced back at least as far as 2007. And in that year, the Brown School's then strategic plan, which was called Impact 2020, um, included in its mission, the idea of community health as a priority outcome. And Community health sort of broadly would evolve pretty quickly into the idea of educating and preparing future social work and public health leaders. That was in the uh, Impact 2020 mission statement for the Brown School. And I wanna thank um, Enola who's here and Tim McBride who couldn't be here for um, you know sort of their uh, institutional memory and sort of documentation of, uh, of how this took place. So that was 2007. It didn't take long for then Brown School Dean Eddie Lawler to act on that strategic plan. Within really a matter of months, in January of 2008, the Brown School was interviewing faculty candidates in public health. And by August of that year, had hired an inaugural faculty um, in public health, and that faculty brought with them four major research centers that still, 16, 17 years later, are thriving here at the Brown School. So Dean Lawler um, convened a, um, a group of those initial faculty and had an immediate challenge for them. That challenge was, you are going to launch an MPH program that doesn't exist. You're going to launch it nine months from now. And you're going to have the curriculum figured out sufficiently in three months so that we can start recruiting new students to an MPH program. So nine months to launch a new program, three months to, be, to know enough that we can sell it to students who we want to educate. So a public health committee um, was formed within days, really, um, of the semester beginning and that committee still exists today. Um, and that group decided to organize the MPH program around an idea that they called transdisciplinary problem solving. So for students in the room or former students in the room, you'll recognize that as the TPS um, courses that are still a part of the public health program today. So um, many schools have a focus in transdisciplinary public health today. But 17 years ago, there were exactly zero programs of public health that had that focus. And so my first question to the, to the panel is, why the transdisciplinary focus? How did that come about as best as you can recall? Ross, you wanna sure. get us started? And uh, Matt's taking us down memory lane. 
2008. It sounds like it's a long time ago. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago. One other thing I'll say about that move, um, when we moved from St. Louis U to, to Wash U in 2008, first of all, the, the Brown School faculty welcomed us and they did a lot of nighttime dinners where we everybody got to eat a lot except for the people presenting to get our get our new jobs and we moved 60 people in 60 days that summer so think of that 60 people in 60 days that was that was some faculty but mostly staff people who were good enough to take a risk and go with us so it was it was really an exciting summer um the transdisciplinary focus i think is largely grounded in what will make a difference in people's health so if you think about um what really drives people health most of it isn't their medical care their health care it's the communities where they live, it's their, their city plans, their access to good education, their access to transportation, the agricultural policies that drive what we eat if you're interested in food. And so that is sort of an underpinning of public health, which really correlates very closely with the idea of social determinants of health. I think that was one of the main drivers to, to help us think about, okay, how do we how do we build this in sort of a non-traditional model um, and put a long word on it, like transdisciplinary, you know, it'd be nice if there was a really short, simple word about that. Um, and I think that gave us um, an, a, a movement that happened pretty quickly. Um, Brown School was already transdisciplinary at that time, and we benefited from having really the top ranked social work program. That first class or two, we had a large number of MSW MPH students. I don't remember the exact percentage, but I think it was probably a third at least of the initial students that were that were joint degree with MSW and PH. And of course that's grown to other other joint degree programs as well. Um, but I think a lot of it was just driven about moving into a, an outstanding existing infrastructure here at the Brown School and then thinking about what would have the biggest impact on people's life and well-being and, and equity. And so I'll I'll stop at that and let others add. So I'm going to go down and try to remember as well. So this is dangerous always, um, but I'll take it a little step back. I can recall sitting in the room with Tim McBride, this guy, that guy, and that guy, um, and trying to figure out how we were going to do this curriculum and how we were going to do it so quickly. And everybody kind of has a role to play, you know, person who's going to put it all together, the people who have the great ideas that this or, this or that. And what I consistently remembered over and over again was Matt saying, we need to look at transdisciplinary. And I was like, what are you talking about? We've got to get a curriculum together. <laughs> um, and it was over and over again, he kept talking about transdisciplinary. And we were coming from a very collaborative group into a very collaborative group. And I I can remember over and over, Matt, you saying that until I finally went home and looked it up. Um, and and it it did it was it was moving things forward. We were moving forward. It was like the next step. It was the 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 best way to advance the science. It was to do it in a collaborative way, and it was to take it beyond what we were currently doing. And so at that point, I was like, okay, you got me a transdisciplinary. Um, but it really was, um, it was coming into a culture and into an environment that was very supportive of taking that next step. Mm -hmm. um, and it was doing it with collaborative colleagues that really advanced that. And it was way ahead of its time. It was way ahead of its time. So that's my recollection. Well, the only thing I have to add is it really reflected our work already. We might not have had the right word for it until Matt, you, you educated us. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I remember, I also remember that meeting yeah. and, <laughs> and one of the things, one of the ideas that came out pretty quickly and well, how do we, you know, how do we structure a transdisciplinary experience in, in these, in these classes? And very quickly, uh, a big part of that was the cells to society approach, which you still see in many of, of the classes. And, I, I remember just thinking in my in our own area at our center in tobacco policy research, um, you couldn't ad address it using one disciplinary approach or one disciplinary fo focus. You really did need a cells to society. And so that became a another part of the fabric of transdisciplinarity. I think if, if I was harping on it, Deborah, um, <laughs> the uh, I think it was for me, it was coming from NIH. And so Federal health research agencies, I think, were quickly coming to the conclusion that 
kind of siloed science from one perspective was kind of plateauing in terms of what we could learn from it. And so there was a really strong push for more team science and cross-disciplinary collaboration. And um, so we were hearing that from a lot of influential sources. And as, as, as Doug said, we were already, I think, predisposed to work in that way. And we're coming into a school um, at the Brown School where there already were so many um, different disciplines represented, both in terms of degree programs and also interests of faculty. So it all seemed to, it all seemed to fit really well. So that MPH program grew uh, really fast. And within a few years, the program was... Just oh, questions. yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to add something because Angela and I, um, the ASPPH, uh, we, we actually did a little session there. Um, and the, the, like you said, this was early years. Um, not very many people were doing this in public health. And um, we, we wrote about sort of the, I like the analogy of um, an ecotone or an estuary and mm -hmm how you know the coming or the confluence of different ecosystems of biomes mixing leads to this really fertile ground of productivity and creativity. And what I recall too, is that the Brown School was a natural experiment for that. And it played out in terms of our collaborations. And um, so I think, I think that's really important. But then I also think like everybody has said that mm -hmm. public health is, is actually a very complex science, like social work, like it's very complex and you have to, I think it's intellectually one of the most interesting because you have to think across disciplines. And our objective in the early years was that transcendence where you're really blending the disciplines and horizontally and vertically cells to society. Thank you, Laura, that's, that's great. And I do think you're right that this was, I mean, a lot of people now use the term whether or not that's, you know, just branding yeah. or or actual i think here the conditions were right for it to be genuine yeah so um laura i'm going to come i'm going to come right back to you because um one of the one of the earliest steps in the evolution of the mph program was moving from a generalist mph into offering specializations and the first two specializations we offered were epidemiology and and global health and laura is the reason that we have uh, that we had a global health specialization um, and then Doug was also the um, inaugural leader of the PhD program in public health sciences, which was another big step forward. And so I'd like to ask the two of you just to uh, comment a bit on, on that stage of the process and what it meant for the growth of public health at the Brown School to move into specializations like global health and have doctoral studies. Should I start? Yeah. Yeah, I think when I was thinking about these questions coming into the panel, um, three very compelling reasons for creating the global health specialization here came to my mind. Um, the first is that, and the, of course this was pre-pandemic, but public health problems don't respect borders. I mean, we've really got to think about these problems across borders. Now solutions, and we saw this in the pandemic, mm -hmm. still embedded in the nation state. I mean, we're stuck with the nation state. We're stuck with international versus global. Um, but that, that was one reason. Um, the second reason uh, is that I also think that public health, and um, Dr. Galea talked about this yesterday, that it's about context, it's about the environment, and thinking about health within that and the drivers of health. So to me, global health offers this rich portfolio of context to compare across different environments and to think about, there's a call at NIH actually, to think about um, infant and maternal mortality in the US and longevity has gone down as we heard about yesterday um, and compare that to other contexts globally. So what are, why is that happening in the US and why, why are we, um, you know, have the highest infant mortality in, you know, among high income countries and, and global health gives you that perspective, I think, and offers some lessons learned. Um, and then I guess, I don't know if this is selfish or Proud, you know, I grew up in Missouri, and I just wanted St. Louis to be on the map. I want St. Louis, and I want Wash U to be part of a global community. So not just world renowned, which I think we we will be, and we are, but I want us to to feel like we are part of that global community. Um. So to get accredited 
as a program in public health, we needed to obviously have an MPH program. You did not need a doctoral program for, for that step. You could have one. And uh, obviously most of our energy was uh, put to getting the MPH program mm -hmm. off the ground. But we also did some discussion among the faculty um, and some agenda setting and, and coming to some consensus around goals. And I was incredibly excited when the number two goal that came out of that was build a PhD program. And even though we also, we, we heard from d the Dean and uh, university administration that doctoral programs are money losing enterprises. What we as a faculty talked about, I, I remember there were two strong themes. There, there was in many ways, a school and a program, they're known by the scholars that we train. Uh, that we're known by training them and they go off and start careers in other academic institutions, many of them. And if you don't have a doctoral program, there's gonna be a, a ceiling and probably a pretty low ceiling on the visibility of what you're, we were doing here in St. Louis and WashU. The other thing is um, because all of us or most of us had come out of great doctoral programs ourselves, we knew how important it was for um, centers and faculty and, re and research groups to have doctoral students um, engaged in this and that our own work is improved when we are spending a lot of time with doctoral students. And, and that was the impetus. And we also got that up more quickly than I th thought we could. There was a third thing, especially as I stepped into the role of the director, is that by building a new doctoral program here at the Brown School, we learned from the storied social work doctoral program here at the Brown School, uh, which I quickly learned was considered the jewel in the crown for doctoral training at WashU. And, and so we, even though it was a new program, I didn't feel like we had to build it from scratch because we had this incredible role model and we actually integrated, and many of you know this, uh, but the core, the core seminar series, two of the three required uh, seminars, um, social work and, doc, and, and public health doctoral students sit together when we take those. And that's essentially another echo of, of the, the integration and the transdisciplinarity of, of, the, pro of the programs. I would just to underscore the critical role of social work in getting the doctoral program in public health sciences up and running. I will just tell you that Renee Cunningham Williams basically held our hands <laughs> through every single step of this application process and was um, a really enthusiastic champion for adding public health. And this um, may not have happened. It certainly wouldn't have happened as quickly as it did without um, the support of public health faculty um, like Renee. Um, just a quick announcement for people who may have come in after the beginning. We, there is food up here, and I think there are still sandwiches and chips. This panel does some of its best work <laughs> to the sound of crunching chips. So... Um, would not be uh, discouraged by that. And for the 57 people who are online now, no chips for you. Um, although if you're watching, if you're watching from your office, there are still a lot of chips left. You could probably come down, grab some and get back to your computer screen. Making me hungry. We're really hungry up here. <laughs> okay, chips for the panel members. Um, let's pivot a little bit and talk um, and talk about public health research at the Brown School. And I've got two main questions for our panel members. The first is about how being at the top school of social work influenced your public health research. So all of you have had long and successful track records as public health scientists. What changed about your work when you came to the Brown School? Ross, you wanna, go, yeah, you wanna go. start? Okay. Um, not in any priority order, but I think there are three things. Um, one was the reputation of WashU and the Brown School, the, the infrastructure that was already here around that reputation. There's a there's a thing when you get a writing grant called the environment, and um, it's one of the ways you could decide if a grant gets funded or not. And when you have the environment of the Brown School and WashU, um, that is that's a big plus. And I think that that opens up doors also to knowing like if you're writing some obscure kind of a research project, someone has experience with that mechanism already here. And where we were before, it wasn't exactly like that because it was a much smaller 
research footprint. So I think that's one part. Um, I think the second part is the ability to have outstanding staff, students, and faculty collaborators and partners and many partnerships that were already set up that we could sort of tap into that were um, super valuable to kind of hit the ground running with a research enterprise. When you move a new, anytime you move to a new job, there's this startup period where you're trying to get to know people and, and learn about it. And that happened very quickly here, um, um, probably more quickly than any any part of my life, any any work part of my life ever. And I think that was a tribute to the to the Brown School and the people here that welcomed us. And I think the third one is, um, and this is a little more particular to to the work of my work and my center's work is the the ability to build out the field of implementation science with great colleagues um, who are already doing it in social work. Um, a number of us who are trying to build that in public health. Um, I think the footprint of implementation science on the medical campus at that time was much smaller. So in some ways, it's like the smaller part of the research enterprise leading the bigger part. And Enola had a lot to do with making that happen in those days. But I think that ability to have hands-on collaborators we could work with and have fun with and do this work and understand the impact of the work, especially for, for me, at least in the field of implementation science was a, a really big plus of being at WashU and building at the Brown School. So, Everything that you just said, you, you took some of my <laughs> I points. <didn't> see <laughs> uh, but but truthfully, um, coming here for me uh, made such a difference in terms of the collaborators. Um, it, it gave me people who, um, you know, it's like putting together a puzzle when you're doing your science. And when you're missing a piece of the puzzle, it's where do you find that? And I could, when we came here, I could find the missing pieces of the puzzle when I was trying to write a grant or when I was trying to answer a question. Um, and I would get help. I mean, I would walk into offices with what I thought was a good idea and walk out finding out that it probably wasn't the best idea, but I could make it a good idea because people could honestly tell me what they thought, um, could critique what I was doing in a way that was helpful, sometimes hard to hear, but helpful. And in many cases, sit down and looking at Enola and, and others in this room who would, who would, um, who did it in the best ways because they're trying to help you to be as successful as possible. And it was a culture that um, that grew when we came over here, and I felt very comfortable with. And I always knew people had my best interests at heart and the best interest of what the science that we were trying to advance at heart. And I think I think that's kind of unique. Um, I think having the students work with us was so great. It advanced the students, so many more students than, than we'd had previously, some outstanding students. Um, and, everything, and everything that Ross had said about the reputation helps so much as you're doing your work, um, helps so much as you're trying so hard to get what you believe in your heart and soul is the right thing to do. Um, you're trying to convince that dumb reviewer that, that <laughs> won't let you get funded or won't let you Reviewer do three, it. usually. Reviewer three. <laughs> it's always reviewer three who swings the group. Um, that have, have, you have people that everybody's willing to help you do that. Um, and bring to it a different science than what you have, a different expertise than what you have to make your work better. So that I think tremendously helped what I was doing. Oh, sure. Um, so again, thinking in advance of the panel about this, what came to my mind, of course, all of these um, sort of big picture benefits, but really what came to my mind um, were individuals. So Enola, fundamentally changed the, the course of my research um, in her mentorship of saying, write that egg paper. <laughs> and, it, and it just went from there. Um, there was Shang Yang and who improved the quality of my study design and cluster design. Um, Trish, you know, I probably have an R01 because, you know, I partnered with Trish. But the person I really wanted to mention um, and tell just a quick story is Carolyn. So Carolyn Lasorgo, for those of you who don't know, she is um, was an anthropologist. She passed away of breast cancer um, last year, two year and a half, year and a half ago. Um, she was a very close friend and a very close colleague. And she is one of the first person that I met at the Brown School. And she also, as a close friend, obviously, but as a colleague, she deepened my research. Um, in Haiti, I remember sitting in focus groups or in-depth interviews with her for 
hours and watching this data unfold that was just beautiful and and gave me the why in my in my research don't cry that's gonna make me cry <laughs> um and, and she would say lord you can do structured observations you can sit and th just these sort of profound you know ways that she changed the, my research and gave me a lot more insight into what was happening in my field site I'll add I'll add one more example of this. Within a couple of years of public health arriving at the Brown School, um, a movement started within the healthcare sector. The healthcare sector discovered that social needs, like housing and food and <laughs> utility bills, this actually messed with people's health. Like if you had if you had challenges in these areas. You, know, you were less healthy and less able to access and use resources and so on. And, and the 15 or so years that have followed have seen um, untold billions invested into sort of addressing that effort. To, to be here at the Brown School at a moment when the healthcare enterprise discovered that social needs mattered was I think um, invaluable in trying to put together public health responses to it. And I can remember um, similarly, I can remember asking social work colleagues to come to a meeting up in 359, the conference room, to, you know, help us think through this for something we were preparing, and everybody came um, and had lots of good ideas. So the so the collegiality, but also just the the in-house expertise in areas that um, you know public health folks didn't necessarily have, really um, dramatically accelerated the progress that um, that our team could make, and, and we're still working in those areas. Um, another research question, just to follow up on that, the, the Brown School's mission, as, um, as I alluded to before, has always had this um, idea of impact uh, at its heart, um, positive impact on individuals and families and communities. I wanted just to um, ask any panel members who, who wanted to, and Laura, maybe we can start with you. And maybe it's eggs, or maybe it's something different. It's eggs. It is eggs. Okay. I would like. I'd like to to um, hear let's... from folks um, about how some of the public health research that you've done is having an impact. Yeah. So Matt's referring to my egg trial. We had a randomized controlled trial in Ecuador um, that had these really big effects on child growth and then child also markers of brain development. And that's just um, flourished into lots of other research projects. It's been replicated in a lot of countries now around the world. So that alone in science has had an impact, but then what I'm very proud of is that it, it, it also, we changed policy in Ecuador. So national policy was changed as a result of that child, that trial. And then at the global level, and this is a, a model that we use with my lab, which is to do the field-based, community-based research, and then try to bring that up to the global level to affect policy there. So the WHO guidelines for complementary feeding were just released last uh, year, and our research has been reflected in that in, in terms of the importance of animal source foods. Um. Well, I'm going to, uh, in, in terms of a connection between impact and the Brown School, I actually want to talk more about um, impact of our evaluation work. Um, a number of years ago, we did a survey uh, and it was, it was pretty, it was pretty quickly after we had, had arrived. And, it, and the survey um, was about, uh, it was about a bunch of stuff, but one of the questions is, uh, to faculty, how much evaluation work do you do? Especially, I think it was focused on local institutions. And I was stunned um, to find out that it was something like well north of 80% of the faculty reported doing evaluation work. And, and, and I, you know, the, the fertile ground for that um, uh, led directly to the development of the Evaluation Center, uh, the Brown School Evaluation Center, because so much of the work we do as scholars um, benefits our communities, our partners, and in our center, the Center for Public Health System Science, we do a lot of evaluation work. And I, I actually have two impact stories. One, Ross, you might remember. Um, early on, we had, we had, we've had a long um, partnership with the Centers for Disease Control, especially the Office on Smoking and Health. And we had done an evaluation of state tobacco control programs around the country. And I, I can't even remember the specific piece of this, but in one of our reports, we had given feedback to CDC. And a year later, 
they produce their own report and guidance to the states that included a whole paragraph from our report and they didn't cite us. And as a good academic, I, 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 was, um, I, was, I was angry. <laughs> You're supposed to cite it. This is our paragraph. And I remember telling you this and you saying, well, that's a, that's a sign of impact. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's more important that they're paying attention than they, that they, than they cite you. And, and, and that was an aha moment for me, which was like the fact that actually any of our work people discover and start using is pretty amazing. They funded you instead of citing you. Sam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the second piece, um, the, the, the second piece is, is more current and more of you may have heard of this, but in our evaluation work of, um, uh, tied with the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences, over the last number of years, we've developed um, essentially an impact evaluation framework called the Translational Science Benefits Model, and which is really about how do we both do agenda setting and training around impact, and then also how do we collect data um, and evaluate impact of our work in ways that go beyond publications and grants. And we were at the right time and right place for this. And I, I've got a favorite slide now. Um, uh, this was a couple of years ago, two thirds of the funded CTSA programs, the Clinical and Translational Science Award programs, there's about 80 of these um, mostly at large universities around the United States, two thirds of them are using our TSBM framework to evaluate their own impacts. And sort of like transdisciplinarity, I think one of the great things about being in a place like this that pushes us to innovate um, is when you, you know, when you happen upon a good idea, this is a great launching platform to get that idea out there. like what you do and I love her eggs. <laughs> <laughs> that study is a great call me egg lady. Yeah, the egg lady. <laughs> um so so I think with me and especially coming here, you know, we have the school of medicine down the road that does all kinds of outstanding work. And and I had trained here originally um on their clinical trial work and they do great work. But what was very clear is that it doesn't go, it doesn't move beyond the walls usually of the of the clinical setting. And so when it came to Brown, what I was able to do is really do a, a, a great job of collaboration with the School of Medicine around some of the work they do in diabetes. In particular, a lot of the work that my focus is on prevention. There's no reason for 30 and 40 year old, mostly women is who I is what I work with or who I work with having complications um, because they live in an area that they don't have funding or they can't get to the physician or they have lousy food or whatever. No reason, that those are fixable kinds of things. And it used to drive me crazy when I did clinical practice because I used to be a nurse in way back when. Um, and so when I came here, I began doing work with community partners, with parents as teachers, as many of you know, uh, which for me, I saw as an infrastructure to reach women and children have a generational impact. I mean, obesity and diabetes is generational. Four generations, we've been, we've been dealing with millions of people with prediabetes and diabetes and all, that, all of the complications that go with it when it's majority preventable in so many ways. It just seemed ridiculous to me. Um, and the Parents as Teachers group provided a national infrastructure for reaching literally hundreds of thousands of mothers and children, caregivers and children, and to do it in a way where you have people going into the home who can deliver information, which was originally around child development. So what, what we did, and I say we because none of this was possible without this great team that's most of them are hiding behind each other sitting in this room because they don't like to be noticed, um, to, to come up with key ingredients to be able to implement that and, and have it work in the routine practice of these educators so that we could deliver it nationwide. And we did multiple trials around this and found we were able to reduce weight, reduce diabetes, uh, prevent obesity, have positive child outcomes in prenatal and, and postnatal women. And so some of the things when I look at what we've done is we've trained literally thousands of educators in working in the homes. We've reached hundreds, well, probably hundreds of thousands of, of mothers and children in doing that as well. We've worked with a community partner, partner who never had nutrition in their 
any of things that they did when they first started. And now they have this outstanding state-of-the-art curriculum that's integrated in their practice of their national educators mm -hmm. who get trained every year and they get updated every year. Um, we're now in a national trial um, called Enrich where all home visiting programs are doing this national curriculum to prevent um, cardiovascular disease and improve outcomes for mothers and children across the country. And if this works, if we show that that works, they will look towards changing policy and how these programs are, are funded. Right now, they are not funded for doing this work with us. They do it because they want to help their families. They don't get paid to do it. They don't, they don't get any credit for doing it. A lot of times they have to fight state systems who don't want them to do it because it's about nutrition. And I don't know if you noticed, but that's not about child development. So I think forward to old policy, old policy rules. And so for me to see the, the difference that we've made in the lives of, of educators who, who benefit, the families who benefit, um, that we've been able to take the science in this great science institution we're in and have it impact those families is wonderful. I, have, I work with great colleagues. I have some, I'm not a dietitian. I work with some of the best dietitians in the world because they work in community. And they understand what it takes to, to get information across and physical activity folks. And a lot of that was because of Brown. A lot of that was coming here at Brown. It's the culture. It's what you pick up. It's the collaboration. Um, but it, it really has made me happy to see how the science is done. And now, as I, as I someday will go to Tahiti, <laughs> we have great <laughs> implementation scientists <clears throat> Um, in this room who do the work who would now take it to the next level and make it even better than it's been with these partners. So that's, that's I think that's cool. So Ross, the bar is set pretty high. So far we have changing national dietary guidelines. Uh, we have um, determining how every CTSA in the land evaluates uh, its performance. And we have transforming an organization that's nationwide in reach that is helping um, moms and kids. So I'll go, just go get so, some chips. Go, go for, so I would just go get a bag of chips. So, um, so I think I'm going to take just a little bit different tack. Actually, I'll do a, a scale up one as well. But, you know, sometimes research, well, there's a quote, that Seneca quote I like, a Roman philosopher said that luck's what happened, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And I think that there was some luck in a, in a story I'll tell you about is another evaluation story. So um, we had a project called GIA, which was, it stands for guide in, in Portuguese and, and uh, Spanish. And we had great collaborators in Brazil. Rodrigo was in Brazil at the time, and of course is here now. And Diana Parra was another key collaborator. She was the project manager slash PhD student slash everything else on the project. And there was a, there was a, a set of um, projects in Recife, Brazil called uh, Academia de Cidade, which stands for City Gyms, and they were ongoing. They seemed like they were useful. They were sort of little city parks where people would come and gather, social support, exercise, walking groups, but they hadn't been evaluated. So we we had the opportunity, and the luck comes in, that there was time for an evaluation. We had high quality scholars working on it, and we did sort of a comprehensive two-part evaluation, and it looks like they worked. And we had, luckily at that time, someone in the Brazilian Ministry of Health named Deborah Salvo, who was just an amazing partner. And we were able to work with her through some magic. I don't even know what all the magic was, but it was it was magic. And this got scaled up to a thousand communities across Brazil, now called Academia de Saudi. And even through changes in government in Brazil, these projects have been ongoing. And so it's it's had a footprint from what turned out to be a relatively small research project funding, which was basically an evaluation and sort of the right person at the right time and the infrastructure here to help us do that. And, and the dean at the time here was Eddie Lawler. And if any of you knew Eddie, he never really would say like, this is a really lame idea. You're going down the wrong. He'd say, well, would this increase our global footprint or will this scale up our work or will this make a difference? And um, sometimes the answer is honestly, you don't know. Um, but here's one we thought, yeah, I think it will. And I think it's worth the investment of both the Wash U funds and, and what the time was CDC funds. So it's another sort of play on some of the same themes that others have seen uh, in Latin America. Best I got. So this is, just a, this is just a flavor of the sort of impact that I think public health uh, research at the, at the Brown School um, 
represents. Um, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It'd be a lot of fun to spend a day sharing these sorts of stories, but this gives you at least um, part of that. Um, I'm going to skip a, kind of a, a process question about the um, about the university's strategic plan and public health emerging and just jump to uh, what happened yesterday, um, actually the last two days, the 17th annual public health conference at Washington University um, was held. And what was um, you know really tremendous by all accounts um, throughout both days um, was sort of capped by um, our first kind of formal introduction to the new dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Sandro Galea. Um, and although he doesn't start until January 1st, he has been integrally involved in um, preparing for the new School of Public Health. And so at yesterday's conference, he laid out his vision for the new school, which um, he summarized uh, in what he called the four by four plan that would organize our approach to building an exceptional school of public health. And the four by four plan referred to four directions. And for those who were there, just as a refresher, um, the four directions were new ways of thinking, new ways of doing the work of public health, better pathways to impact and novel partnerships um, by four strategies. So four by four directions by strategies. The four strategies were um, having a world-class faculty, having outstanding teachers and students, um, an idea that um, he called public health plus, which really was partnerships. We're not going to do this alone. We're going to form major partnerships with all sorts of conventional and less conventional um, partners. And uh, having local to global impact. And so for our for our panelists, and this will be sort of the last question for you, and then we'll open it up to the um, to the group for any questions that they might have. For our panelists, what excites you about um, this vision and what you heard yesterday? And how might close ties to the Brown School help to achieve it? Anyone want to go first? Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> um, so I think what I heard yesterday, what what first made me very excited is I, I love the vision. Uh, I like it that we have uh, we have a clear vision um, that of moving forward. But I also like that it had it talked about how we get to that vision or how we reach that vision. It wasn't you, know, you can have vision, but if you don't know how you're going to get there, you know it, a lot of people have vision. I have vision, but <laughs> it doesn't always mean that, that it pans out. Um, and I liked that it was thought through with, with um, of what's so important, you know, where we want to be and how we want to get there. Um, and that to me made a, made a big difference. The other piece when I, when I really think about it is that, you know, he, Sandro was on the, um, he was on the advisory board for all of the planning. He was there from the, really the get-go. He knew a lot about what was going on. He knew a lot about what was the Brown School, what we had done, what we had done collaboratively, what we were trying to do. And a lot of what was there around the, uh, the interdisciplinary, great faculty, interdisciplinary approach, uh, partnerships, all of those things, we were, we've been a model for that with Brown. We've been a model for that with social work. It's really been a model of how you might be able to develop the university around that. Um, it's not just us. It's how do we take this and change WashU? And in changing WashU, we change the community. We change so much of what we do. We go local to global. It's one community, as Laura says. We, we're doing this. We were a model for that. And now that model is being translated in many ways to the new school with a vision and with steps to getting there. And to me, it's just a natural progression of what's been going on and and it's another reason why everything that we've done so far with social work is so critical to continue to do that as a strong model for looking forward, because that's what it's been. That's what it's been. I'll just add two quick things. Um, one, one thing that excited me, well, first of all, if you saw Sandra, he's a big thinker, so it's gonna be operationalizing a lot of really big thoughts, but I think that will happen. I think the first part I would say is this, ability to collaborate across schools, which is not always easy and well done in universities, but making that a core part of the mission of this new School of Public Health. And that'll start with the Brown School. 
it'll follow with a med school, and then it'll probably get a little harder with places like law, engineering, um, arts and sciences, but there's there's parts of that in every school that I think there are meaningful collaborations and the undergrad program that's starting up now is a great example of that. And it's starting with a big a big first class in public health that um, that's already going on. So I think those collaborations we can build on. And then the other for me that's exciting, and this is sort of folded in, I think a few parts of, of what Sandro talked about yesterday is the ability to really look at impact differently for, for a new school of public health. Like imagine in five years from now and 10 years from now, is anything in this community different or better because there was a new school of public health at WashU? No other school has ever done that. And no other school has been able to do that with sort of a new thing going on. It might be like TSBM on steroids, but um, it. I think there's an opportunity there to set that up and set a framework up where we could really, now we can never show a cause and effect for every single thing, but we could show contribution to meaningful changes in local to global health and well-being of populations that I think is very different from from other established schools. Yeah, just to echo, um, Ross, what you just said, uh, I was sitting there listening to Sandro, and in my head I was, you know, okay, four by four matrix, so that, <laughs> that means 16 cells. <clears throat> and I was, our center, our center is actually just starting a, a what will hopefully not be a super long strategic planning process. Uh, and as and I was realizing, okay, where does our center and the people in the center and the work we do and the partnerships we have, where does it fit in this matrix? And I got more and more excited because it fit in more than one place. And probably the biggest place is, you know, Matt, in your, in your reading through the four directions and the four strategies, impact is one of the few words that, is mentioned in both places as both a strategy and and um, a, uh, a direction, and and so I think this will be a school that will emphasize work that matters. That makes me very excited. So, I I love matrices. I love the movie The Matrix. Um, <laughs> I think it's just fascinating to think in in all those dimensions. I hope we have even more than four by four. Um, but actually, what I what I walked away from both of his talks on, on um, I guess it was Thursday and Monday. Monday and Tuesday. Um, <laughs> was was the conceptual or the philosophical conversation about what is health, and I think that also brings me back to um, what I will walk away with from the Brown School, and you know, the way he described health to me. Um, you know, that people can, enabling people to live rich and fulfilling lives. That is what public health and social work is about, is ensuring the well-being of very vulnerable populations, helping people realize their full potential. And that to me is just so exciting to think about at a curriculum, but also at a research level. I The collaborations with the Brown School aren't gonna go away. I mean, those are deep rooted, um, they will continue, I think, Looking into the future with my role at the Center for the Environment, there's also some really exciting collaborations with the Booter Center with env on environmental justice that will that will continue with the Brown School. So these are this will will endure. Thank you to all of our panelists. We have we have uh, ten minutes left in our session. We would be delighted to take any questions that uh, folks have. We have no way of getting them from the now 60 people following online, sorry. Um, but for those of you in the room, anything you'd like to hear more about? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Laura, you mentioned global and international in a way that suggests two distinct concepts. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, actually, we have a an, an article you can read about this. Um, Anne, Anne Siebert Coleman uh, used to be with us on faculty, and Anne and I wrote a, a whole piece on this perspectives piece on what's the difference between global and international. And international is kind of the term that we use to, you know, with different nation states. That's what that refers to. So it's, again, going back to what I was describing, um, that sovereignty still lies within you know, a nation or a country. And we, we definitely saw that with the pandemic. But global is supposed to be more transcendent and 
um, you know, across. And I, and I always had that vision for the UN that it's, a, you know, one big global community. It doesn't really work that way, but, <laughs> um, but problems do. And so I think we do have to think transcend, you know, across, across borders um, in public health. Thank you. Yes, Rodrigo. It's on. It's on. Well, I'd like to thank you all the work you have done, Sarah Lees, Nola, Sonia, many others, Mary, Adams, and Elsa, you have been part of this, and others. So uh, a deep, deep gratitude to everybody that made this enterprise. So maybe you should write this down the document, become an essay, maybe hmm. experience the world, you know, building a product. How is experience of, you know, starting from scratch in a way, you know, leadership changes in uh, WashU at Brown School, how all of these experiences have, have changed, all the experiences, I would say, have changed you as, as, as a human level. How do you, how you have been affected personally and how different, how this has changed you, you know, uh, as a person after you know, 17 years now? Is, is that more uh, <laughs> That's an impossible question, uh, Rodrigo. It really is. But the thing that popped into my head um, as you were asking that question is imagine me, a scrawny 18 or 19-year-old. I was an undergrad here at WashU, and I'd probably come out of some biology or pre-med class, and I was walking on campus, and I was thinking, Wow. Wouldn't it be great to work at WashU, knowing that would never happen? And, um, you know, in terms of how it's changed me as a person, I, I tell people I have the best job in the world, and I mean it. I mean, I just, it's just been a dream fulfilled for me. And, and well, I'll just stop there. I agree with that. I, I think that um, to me, when I was in grad school, I thought, you know, I think I'd be a student my whole life if I could make a living at it. And it turns out that's what being a professor is. You get to go to school every day. You get to learn from the great students. You have great staff. You have great faculty colleagues. And they pay you to do it. So it is the best job in the world. And it, that's, like, that's like the dream job. So I don't know if that really connects to your question, but that's what popped in my mind. I think for me, um, and I, I think some of you have heard me say it, is that the one thing about coming to Wash U is that I'm never bored, ever bored, not even a little teeny tiny bit bored and always busy because there's always something to do and something to learn and somebody to learn from. And, and I love going into a room and sometimes I look around and go, what am I doing here? I'm the, <laughs> um, so it's just, it's for me, it was like, I, I had been here 15 years. I had gone and met all these colleagues at SLU. And then when I came back, I said, I felt like I was coming home and my family was coming with me. Some of that's good and some of that's not, but you know, <laughs> just saying. I'm kidding. Who's the black sheep? <laughs> I would, I would say something about, um, working with groups, uh, individuals like these, um, and seeing that you can have uh, the courage to try really big, scary, unknown things and and roll with whatever comes of it. It was a pretty big deal, honestly, to leave a school of public health, to come to a school of social work and have no idea what that was gonna be like. But But trusting the people who you were surrounded with and trusting the Na the nature of the organization, and then building a, a school of public health and, and anchoring anchoring it around something that nobody else was doing at the time. Like that took, I think, a lot of courage and sort of, you know, trust among colleagues. And now we're doing another, you know, we're doing another leap of faith here with, uh, you know, with the school of public health. And so that's certainly something I've learned. I hope I hope others um, have experienced something like that or will will dare to. Um, other questions from the group? Yeah. Echo the gratitude um, to the five of you, not only for really thoughtful panel together, but I think each of you have um, impact factors in public health, not for, you know, just the science that you do, but the mentorship and the leadership that you have for so many people all over the world is, is really profound. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I also have a quick story. Um, so a few years ago, I needed a picture of Laura for a presentation. 
like we were doing together. And I should have, you know, the most efficient thing probably would have been just to go to the Brown faculty website and grabbed her headshot, but instead I put um, Laura Iannotti into Google and I put Laura I-A-N and the autofill came up, Laura Iannotti eggs. <laughs> 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 so she is known even by Google as the egg lady. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they, they did come to me wanting to give me money. Right <laughs> that British thing, you're a good egg. Yeah, exactly. Egg head thing. Yeah. yeah. It was a great study. It was a great study. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and then my question is, you you each kind of, I mean, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in, in talking about the evolution of the program at the Brown School, but if you could talk about maybe the evolution of our students here and how the Brown School has had an impact on um, public health masters and graduate or masters and doctoral students and what you've seen in trends over time for our, our students because of the Brown School as well. well I'm going to start. Oh. <laughs> Give it to the egg lady. No, no I'm going to start just because I want to say, you know, it's it's all embodied in the alumni. I mean, the alumni, what they have accomplished and what you students will accomplish are just remarkable. I got an email this morning from World Food Program, a former, she was Lindsay Wise, Lindsay Horton. She was the one of the very first students in our program. And she, she's now up in, and I mean, it's just remarkable what they've accomplished. And I think to the student point, um, my classes have been so much richer when the MSW students are part of the, the mix. Yeah, and I know we're almost out of time, but in terms of a proof of concept, I remember a class that had both social work and doctoral students in it. And in the same conversation, I heard public health students telling the, the social work students, you just have to learn the stats package. <laughs> But in the same conversation, the social work students are saying, you have to spend time in North St. Louis. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing because it, it was like, it was, it was, you know, the proof yeah. that the idea was working. I oh, go ahead. Just, just to add on to that a little bit, it's just the interaction of students has just over time has just become richer and richer with the collaboration and much of what you're exactly what you're describing. Um, and I think that that's unique. And that's, I think that that's something that will continue as we move forward as well, because it's been, it's, it was baked in and that piece will continue as we move forward. So, yeah. And I think I would just add the, the change from the earliest groups of students. to now, I think that was part of your question, Angela, is the larger number of, students from other parts of the world, which bring in richer discussions, um, students who may end up going back to their home country who can have an impact that they might not have otherwise had. And we're seeing that not only in our students here, but in a lot of other training programs for, for researchers in different fields, including in implementation science. So I think that sort of global footprint, at least in the, in the public health since we started in the first, first class in 2009 has been a, a big change that's been pretty exciting. We are at the end of our hour together. I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank all of you um, who joined by Zoom. And thank you to our panel. Folks may be able to stick around if you have additional questions. So, thank you. Um, this was fun because we all had, um, I was, you, sh you should hear this too. So I went, Sue and I went to Menu Rui just a few weeks ago. You know, it's the ramen place that you have to stay in line. And there's a young 